I received the report from Scott Shanahan while we were uh, gone, and uh, I was uh, much impressed by the tribute that he gave to his father, and we plan to print that in Spiritual Perspectives uh, two weeks from today. If you have not seen that, I'm sure it will be of interest to you. This evening, we want to notice the song of the vineyard from Isaiah 5, 1 through 7, which was just read for us. Isaiah had gone back and forth in his opening chapters, condemning the evil that was in Judah, and yet also mentioning promises of the church to come and a time of restoration. Isaiah 5, we only read seven verses. The entire chapter, though, is the last long condemnation of the people of Judah in the first 12 chapters. Uh, the first 12 chapters focus on Judah. After that, uh, there are several messages for other countries and so forth. Uh, that we will, will, do not plan to go into. But uh, these 12 chapters have both the positive and the negative concerning his people. The song of the vineyard is not a happy melody. It begins with a favorable outlook by God which causes his expectations to be great, but the wonder and anticipation fall by the wayside and give way to great disappointment. The prophet Isaiah appears to be the singer of the first two verses. If not, then I'm not quite sure who it is, but it doesn't matter because it's the content of the message that we want to concern ourselves with. But after those two, first two verses, God steps in to ask certain questions. Tonight, we want to see how we might profit from looking at this song of the vineyard. In verse 1, Isaiah sings to his well-beloved, whom I think we are to understand is a reference to God. The vineyard was located on a fruitful hill. The ground was already uh, fruitful, which would make it an advantageous location. So God dug it up, cleared out all of the stones. When, uh, I fully understand that because when Barb and I live in Peoria, we had a plot of ground, fairly substantial. And every winter we would grow a bumper crop of rocks. I didn't plant little stones, but there came up these big rocks every year. I threw them into the wheelbarrow and hauled them off. Had I been a little shrewder, I probably should have decorated them and sold them as homegrown pet rocks. But uh, mainly, I was just wanting to get rid of them. God is preparing the vineyard in the same way. He is removing the stones that are present uh, to have it be a great and fruitful garden. So then God planted a choice vine in verse 2. He didn't plant something that was half dead just to see what would happen to it if it would grow. He took the best that he could find. He built a tower in the midst, probably from the stones he had cleared out. And from this tower, he would have a good vantage point to keep an eye on the vineyard. He also prepared a wine press for the luscious grapes that he planned to harvest. Everything was in readiness, but the song ends sadly. 
He had every reason to expect that the land would bring forth good grapes, but instead he got wild or bad grapes. Some say rotten. Now this illustration is not difficult to figure out. The seed of Abraham is the good vine. Abraham was a faithful patriarch. And his children had uh, that same capability which they exercised in the time of Joshua when an entire generation was faithful unto God. And so that good uh, vine was planted in Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey, a fruitful hill. And God removed all the stones that were in that area, perhaps a reference to getting rid of the idolatry of the nations of Canaan, which he did through Israel acting as his arm of judgment upon those nations. Uh, also, through Moses, God had given his people the holy law, but the grapes produced a worthless crop. What went wrong? Well, God asked the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judah to judge between himself and the vineyard in verses 3 and 4. What more could he have done? He had a good location. He had a good vine. He had uh, removed obstacles that would be in their way, and yet he got bad grapes. God has been faithful to his word. The problem lie with the people's choices who lived in the land. In verses 5 and 6, God reacts to all that we have described here. And... Uh, what will become of the vineyard? It'll become a wasteland. What do you do with a vineyard that produces bad fruit? You destroy it. In verse 7, God describes the vineyard as Israel and the people of Judah as his pleasant plant. But what you don't see is from the Hebrew the plays on words that exist. He says, I looked for justice, but got oppression or bloodshed. Mishpat is the Hebrew word for justice. Mizpah, very close in spelling, is the word for bloodshed. I looked for Mishpat, but got Mizpah. And then there is another contrast as well. I looked for righteousness, Sadaka, but I got a plaintive cry, Sayaka. Very close again in uh, spelling and pronunciation. So it is a play on words that God uses. I expected this, but I got this. Just slightly different, but a total opposite and repeated a second time with different words. So that's the way the vineyard had gone. Now what we want to notice, though, is that this is not the only time that we have this imagery in the Old Testament. First, we want to know, uh, notice that this is a common theme and let's take a look at a couple of other passages. <clears throat> First, we want to go to Psalm 80 and notice verses 8 through 16. Psalm 80, beginning with verse 8. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations 
and planted it. And once again, you see the reference to Canaan. They did come out of Egypt, and God did give them a nation, uh, Canaan, and planted his vine there. You prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root, and it filled the land. The hills were covered with its shadow and the mighty cedars with its boughs. She set out her boughs in, uh, to the sea and her branches to the river, probably referring to the Euphrates River. Why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by the way pluck her fruit? The boar out of the woods uproots it and the wild beast of the field devours it. Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see and visit this vine and the vineyard which your right hand has planted and the branch that you made strong for yourself. It is burned with fire, it is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. And uh, so the psalmist was uh, noticing this as well as Isaiah's prophecy of it. But let's also go to Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 21. Uh, a little less uh, description, but the same principle is involved here. Jeremiah 2, 21, Yet I planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality, how then have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an alien vine? So these things are noticed by more than one writer, a psalmist and two prophets, all using the same image. By the way, Jesus uses the same image in the New Testament. Now, all of these are primarily a description of the same thing. Let's go and read the one in Matthew, chapter 21, uh, verses 33 through uh, 44. In that text, beginning with verse 33 of chapter 21, hear another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard, and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Does all that sound familiar? And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. We have a little bit different aspect of this one, but it starts out the same, does it not? Now when vintage time drew near, he said to his servants, uh, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive the fruit. And the vine dressers took on the uh, servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then, last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, and said, they said among themselves, This is the... Uh, Heir, come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? And then they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vi vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruit in their season. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the, in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. The vine had not improved in uh, a thousand years, had it? 
It was as bad as it was in the days of Isaiah, 750 years earlier. It was as bad as it was at the time of uh, Jeremiah, almost 600 years. It was as bad as it was in the time of the psalmist. The same point is being made. There is a common theme in all of this. And this setup seems to be the same in terms of preparation, but the vine dressers that rented it out refused to give the share that the owner had in it. He even sends his son to collect and they kill him, thinking somehow they will maintain control. Does anybody agree with that interpretation? They were wrong in the way they figured this, weren't they? They would be punished and the vineyard would go to others, namely to the Gentiles. Now let's read one more passage in connection with this text. And that would be Luke 13, verses 6 through 9. We have yet another aspect of this that we want to look at. We've seen the original, the, the vine producing worthless grapes. We've seen the one where it was rented to the vine dressers and they refused uh, to pay what they owed. Now let's look at one more. Luke 13, verse 6. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a tree, fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this tree and found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that you can cut it down. So how did that work out? Well, notice that it follows verse 5. And verse 5 says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Did those in this illustration repent? We know that they did not. And uh, so they were destroyed. The owner was patient. But there comes a time when it, if it refuses and refuses and refuses to bear fruit, it's going to be destroyed. What else would you do with it? Now, today, Christians are part of the vine, not as a nation, but individually. Let's go to John chapter 15, beginning with verse 1. <clears throat> John 15, beginning with verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, was he exalted? Does he give it more homage? No. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and they gather them together and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so shall you be my disciples. 
Jesus wants us to abide in him and grow. As Peter concluded his second epistle, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. We must abide in the vine in order to be of value, in order to bear fruit. So let's see some lessons that we can learn from the song of the vineyard. Number one, God prepared the ground. You know, when God put man and uh, then woman into the Garden of Eden, that had been a place prepared. He had prepared the earth for man to live in. Of course, we know man sinned and was thrown out, but God had prepared a place for them initially. And then after the flood, God prepared a nice, fresh, clean earth for Noah and his family. But once again, sin gained control. Then later on, God prepared for Israel the land of Canaan. And uh, as we have heard described in uh, the parable of the, uh, or the song of the vineyard, we see what happened to those people. But God made pres uh, preparation for them. God also prepared the church for his people, the saved, in which are all spiritual blessings available in the heavenly places. So God has always made adequate and abundant preparation for his people. When something has gone wrong, it has not been God. It has been the people. We in the church must be careful. How many are flirting with worldliness, with immodest clothing, with shameful speech and behavior? with carnal forms of entertainment. The Bible gives us a few passages, and, and actually there are many more, but let's just look at a few. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, what? A living sacrifice, not to be as much like the world as you can be, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's also notice 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and uh, verse 1. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, there's a conclusion after advising brethren to be separate. The conclusion is in chapter 7, verse 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the fl uh, flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the word of God. And uh, just the uh, last verse, uh, all seven verses, of course, have great value, but uh, we just want to notice verse 7 from 1 Thessalonians 4. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. And uh, let's go to one more from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. Peter writes... <clears throat> as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct, because it is written, be holy because I am holy." Does anyone think the nation of Israel concentrated on being holy? They did not. Had they done so, they would have been good grapes. 
but they were worthless because they did not sanctify themselves. They did not walk according to holiness. And so that's a lesson for us. We need to be careful. We don't fall into the same trap as they did. A second lesson is that we need to realize as God providentially watched over them, so does he do the same thing for us. Uh, Philippians 4 and verse 19, but God will supply all your need according to the riches of his grace. And so God uh, made provision for us by giving us the church and he constantly is looking out for our best interests to make sure that we have opportunities to grow spiritually and to follow him and to maintain the holiness that comes from having our sins washed away in the blood of Christ. Third, God does not excuse unrepentant sin in his followers. I tell you, uh, unless you repent, you shall likewise perish. There are those who have this doctrine of once saved, always saved. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible says if you don't repent, you're going to be lost. And uh, even Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 27, he shows how that even he must take careful heed as to how he walks. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, Paul says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself might be disqualified. Now, why didn't Paul say, Well, you know, I don't really have to worry about myself because once saved, always saved, you know. No. He didn't know that. He didn't believe that. He didn't preach that. What he preached is that he had to be careful lest after he preached to others and saved them that he might be disqualified. And uh, so that is a third lesson. One in the Old Testament illustrated by the Song of the Vineyard and also taught in the New Testament, we must be careful and take heed to ourselves. Number four, God gave the people his holy law. They had no excuse for their corruption. They had no excuse for their participation in idolatry. How far do you have to read into the Ten Commandments to figure that out? The first one is, you shall have no other gods before me. The second one is, you shall make no graven image. You don't have to read and be a philosophical giant to understand those two simple principles. And yet, the people rebelled against him. Jesus gives us the truth. If we are his disciples, then you uh, shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Had God given his people error, or if he had given us error, we would have an excuse for not doing what is right. But he gave us the truth by which we are sanctified. As Jesus prayed for his apostles, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. We are without excuse. If we are not of the quality of the good grapes that God expected, he expects fruit from us also. We need to avoid being the unfruitful vine and bear fruit a hundredfold, or 60 or 30, as according to the parable. 
shall the church be fruitful or are we going to be a vine that is destroyed? It's up to us. Shall we abide in the vine or depart from it and not rely upon Jesus our Lord? Those are choices that are up to us. This evening, if we can help you in making the right decision, please let us know. If you have uh, fallen away, been unfaithful, not been serious, maybe walking too close to the world, do you not need to repent? Those things will hinder your fruitfulness. We need to do what is right, what is honorable, what is holy before God. Or if you have never obeyed the gospel, you can now at this time do so by repenting of your sins. It all starts uh, with repenting after you believe, and that will lead you then to obey and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and that will make you holy, and God will work with you to keep you that way, and you need to have that commitment yourself to stay that way. So can we help anyone in either one of these things? If we can, let us know while we stand and while we sing.